Illinois is bidding for ventilators. Where you have a problem with ventilators, we're working very hard trying to find nobody in their wildest dreams would have ever thought that we need tens of thousands of ventilators. The ventilator will make the difference between life and death, literally. We're all trying to buy the same commodity, literally the same exact item. So you have 50 states competing to buy the same item. We all wind up bidding up each other, bidding on a ventilator. Greatest critical need are ventilators. As an anesthesiologist, I work with ventilators all the time. I check them, troubleshoot problems with them, and basically had to master them before graduating residency and becoming board certified. Every single patient I care for that receives general anesthesia is put on a ventilator, so it's pretty much a part of my everyday life to work with vents. So as the airway experts, we are called for intubations. We are there to help manage the ventilator, especially if we're using an anesthesia vent. We can place lines intravenously and also centrally into the larger veins to help give life-supporting medication. And then we can help with the management of patients in critical situations. So that brings me back to the topic of the video. Why are so many people with COVID-19 on ventilators and how does it help them? From what we currently know, COVID-19 has a directed affinity for the respiratory system and readily attaches to the mucous membranes in the eyes, nose, and mouth of the host. Once it's attached, it uses the host cell to reproduce itself. It's an RNA virus, which then makes viral proteins and new copies of the virus. Once these foreign viral proteins are detected by the host's immune system, the inflammatory response is evoked. This defense mechanism can cause a storm of chemicals to be released, one of which is known as cytokines, which are usually responsible for causing vessels to dilate and bring extra immune cells, blood, and fluids to the lungs. This will lead to a viral pneumonia, as can be seen on a chest x-ray or a CT scan or CAT scan. The extra fluid and immune cells present in the lungs fill up alveoli or air sacs and make it hard for oxygen to diffuse into the bloodstream. So people get symptoms of shortness of breath. Patients with severe disease often need oxygenation support. High flow oxygen and non-invasive positive pressure ventilation have been used, but they aren't really safe since they can cause aerosolization or micro droplets to be released, and that can spread even further. Some patients may worsen to the point of respiratory failure where they can no longer independently breathe effectively due to fatigue or severity of lung disease, or even other organ systems may begin to fail. These patients can only survive if intubated or if a breathing tube is placed into their trachea and they are put on a ventilator, which will help do most or all of the work of breathing for them. So ventilators are really helpful to help support the patient's breathing while they're recovering from the effects of the virus and take off some of the load of the work of breathing so that they don't become fatigued and go into respiratory failure. So they do really help patients who cannot breathe well on their own and are still very much in a critical state and you know need to be watched very carefully. Usually the need for intubation will occur after the shortness of breath becomes severe. So on average, a patient would require intubation around day six through eight after the shortness of breath symptom has an onset and then will be watched for further decline. 
A ventilator is a machine that can support breathing in a number of ways. Mainly, it provides additional positive pressure to help improve ventilation or the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide within the lungs. And it can supply extra oxygen, plus improve blood oxygen levels by helping to keep collapsed air sacs open. The first step in mechanical ventilation is called endotracheal intubation. Once you are asleep, your doctor will use an instrument called a laryngoscope to perform the intubation. A laryngoscope, which consists of a handle, light, and dull blade, helps guide the endotracheal tube to its proper position. Your doctor will tilt your head back slightly and insert the laryngoscope through your mouth and down into your throat taking special care to avoid contact with your teeth. Using the blade, your doctor will gently raise the epiglottis, which is a flap of tissue protecting your larynx. He or she will then advance the tip of the endotracheal tube into the trachea. Once the endotracheal tube is in the trachea, your doctor will inflate a small balloon surrounding the tube to make sure it remains snugly in place. Your doctor will remove the laryngoscope and tape the tube to the corner of your mouth to prevent it from being jostled out of position. Your doctor will check to see that the tube is properly positioned in the lower part of the trachea by inflating your lungs with a special bag and listening for breath sounds on both sides of your chest. If the end of the tube is too low, both lungs will not receive the same amount of air. In some cases, an x-ray is taken immediately after intubation to confirm the tube's placement. Once the endotracheal tube is in the proper position, your doctor will attach it to the mechanical ventilator, a specially designed pump that aids respiration by delivering well-oxygenated air into the lungs and permitting carbon dioxide to escape from the lungs. Levels of oxygen and carbon dioxide will be closely monitored to confirm that the ventilator is working. Patients with advanced respiratory disease, or ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, often have a severe reduction in ventilation and become hypoxic, or they have very, very low oxygen levels in the blood. They become dependent on ventilators for survival and often they require sophisticated ventilation modes only available on ventilators used in the critical care or ICU setting. This is where the current demand lies. The number of patients needing this limited supply concurrently can really overwhelm our healthcare system as has occurred most notably in Italy. Ventilator alternatives have been proposed and are widely used such as anesthesia vents, which you may have already heard are being used to support many patients once the ICU vent supply has been exhausted. So ICU vents do help to reduce the patient's work of breathing and help them to rest so they can recover from the infection and um, help to oxygenate their blood while they're recovering as well. In some patients, however, they don't do well, even with the most support. In that situation, the next step is ECMO, or extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, in which the body's blood is bypassed through a system that oxygenates it and then returns it, kind of like dialysis, but that's the last resort. Anesthesiologists are key in providing their expertise on the management of these vents and for caring for patients in need of critical care because we have the training and the experience. So I'm actually really motivated during this trying time because I feel this is an opportunity to help patients outside of the OR and also to show other medical fields and the public um, what anesthesiologists do and the grand scope of our practice. We're not just out here pushing gas and propofol, but we can do so much more and we are doing so much more to help the public in this really, really tough time to get a handle on the pandemic and keep patients safe. So until next time, thank you so much for watching. Please like, subscribe, give me suggestions in your comments about what other videos you would like to see and I'll try to get that to you as soon as I can. And as always, be safe and take care of yourself. Wear your mask, wash your hands.